Welcome to Unfiltered. I'm your host, Sarah Jane Foster. Now, my next guest was in a movie with Snoop Dogg and Keanu Reeves, nominated for a Grammy, and he's on our TVs five days a week on one of Ireland's longest running afternoon show. And most importantly, he's from Kerry. Dahi O'Shea, you're very welcome to my podcast. Finally, I get the invitation to come. I've been watching all these great people, Foster and Alan, Nathan Carter, uh, Terry Prone, waiting the phone ring any minute now so i'd imagine now you were down at the bottom of the list there was my name thanks <laughs> no you were on top of the list to be fair uh, now Doc, you've yes. been in this industry for over 25 years yeah. so bring me back to the start i want to get to know how you actually got into this crazy industry it, it's, it's it's strange there in one sense because i never had any plan or anything to be on tv if uh, you asked me in my teens would i be on tv or would i go to the moon first i'd say Do you know i probably have a better chance of hitching a ride to the moon uh, it was never my plan. When I was in school, I didn't want to be there. Uh, I was asked to leave twice for uh, on different occasions uh, on a, for a week at a time. And I was really, I really found it hard in school. I didn't want to be there, really. And it was a, at a stage in one sense where maybe five years before I did my leaving cert, Sarah, uh, the, a lot of people didn't go to college. They immigrated. And maybe 10 years after it, the majority of people went to college. So it was that twilight zone. Things were changing. Like, I got 700 points in my leaving cert that people will be very kind of shocked <laughs> to hear, like, you know. But um, I did it twice. Like, I got 300 the first year and I got 400 the second year. Did so you repeat your leaving cert? I did, yeah. Oh, did you? Oh, you I repeated quit. my leaving cert and I didn't want to. Why I, did you repeat then? Because my mother wanted me to. If I'm being very honest, um, I did my leaving cert in 1994 and I put a lot of work into it. Like, I didn't want to be in school and then all of a sudden I said, you know, I kind of need to... St- I need to do something because everybody else was doing something so but I did started, you know what you wanted to do then i kind of i did i kind of had it in my head to become a teacher at that stage uh and so i went off to america in 94 the summer of that after my leaving cert my brother danny was in chicago so i went over there and the plan really you have was an american stay, passport i have an american passport all my life yeah my parents were married over there in the 60s my eldest sister and brother were born there right so we all became citizens and so i was there in chicago in august got the leaving cert results saying Look, mom, I tried my best, like, and I didn't get the course. So, look, I'd probably stay here. So, was she, that the first or the second? That was the first time. Okay. So, the second time after that, then she said, "Look, will you, will you think of coming home? Do repeat your leaving cert?" I said, "I don't really want to repeat my leaving cert." Like, I was, I was a doorman at a in a in a nightclub in Chicago when I was eighteen, right? Saying, "Sorry, sorry, you're not twenty one. You can't get in here." <laughs> right. <laughs> So, uh, you had the height when you were 21. Yeah, so then I said, okay, I'll come home. So I came back then in the middle of September into a class that I didn't really know in one sense. So I stuck it out for the year and I, I was there saying, look, I've got to give it a go again. So I put in a bit of work towards the end. And I got the course from Mary I to become, I had to do a, a Bachelor of Arts and History in Irish. They were the subjects. So I was, the plan then was to become a teacher. That was it. So then I, during the summers, then I worked on the ferry boats out of the Blasket Islands which was a great job altogether. And I remember... So you talk, you were like a tour guide? No, well, I was, well, there were smaller boats, so I used to drive one of them, and then I used to collect the money and talk to people as well and have the track and kind of a Dell Boy stuff, you know, that I was <laughs> apparently good at. You always had the gift of the gab. Uh, yeah, but I was okay. interested in people, like, as well, which was good fun. So, and then I remember I was at the bottom of the pier one day, and one fellow said, look, would you be interested in going on the weather on TG Car and I said what do you mean going on the weather on TG Car oh to present it like I said what would I be doing so they said look come up and have a look so I didn't get the HDIP the first year which you need to become a qualified teacher so I said I got a part time job teaching so I said you know what I'll go up and see what these crowd are on about so I said oh on television <laughs> I, said, oh, dear, I don't know about that no so uh, so I came back the following weekend and they put me on television doing these links so then it took off from there and I was teaching during the week and when you start off as a teacher, a lot of young teachers will know, like you don't make a whole lot of money. So this was a side job. So the side job then turned into a full time job the following year, Sarah. And that and I <coughs> I, I, I haven't worked since. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how it happened. Like I had no grow to be on TV. I never had any aspirations to be on TV. It wasn't something that I wanted. It wasn't something that I even thought about. So it was strange in that sense. But was that guy that came up to you, yeah. did you know him? Oh, I knew him, yeah. And then, like say, I got a call from another lady. She worked in TG Carr and she was just said, look, we're looking for people to, to work at the weekend. Would I be interested in doing it? Yeah. And I said, sure, listen, we'll have a look at it. And that was it then. And it turned into working most weekends and then during the summer. And then there, was, there were full-time jobs at that time. The person left the, the job. Yeah. So I, said, I applied for it and I got it. 
And it was the same week that I got the H-dip in Minute and I got the H-dip in Queens and Belfast as well. All in the same week as, a, as as the year job in TG Car that day. But it was like kind of known if you did well in the year that you'd be there for for life if you wanted to. So be. what, you didn't end up doing the no. dip then because you got into no. TV? I'm not qualified to do anything I'm doing. That is, yes, you definitely are. You could teach I'm, us all. No, I have no qualifications for TV or <laughs> teaching anything. That is so yeah. funny. So do you still know that person that asked you? Oh, to I do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, I worked with her for years in TJ Cahar. Yeah, I was, I was in TJ Cahar 11 years altogether. I was full-time staff there. But what about the guy that came to you when you were working on the, the boat? Yeah, I don't know where he is now, actually. But, like, do you kind of think back him and go, like, if he wasn't there that day, you it might... Could, yeah, it, it, it could have yeah, it, it probably it, it could have been totally different. Um, do you know the way there's always like somebody there that's like pushing you yeah that's you. sliding doors kind of thing what yeah would happen? yeah that, that could have happened as well uh, and again it's just, it's just because I wasn't really attracted to being on not, I can't even say I wasn't attracted to being on TV because I never even thought about being on it so what did he see in you then I said like so he saw the fella kind of having to crack with people um, like I had a degree in Irish so my Irish I spoke Irish all my life as well so that was the, that was the other side of it yeah um, and I suppose this fella saw okay this fella will be a bit of fun like I was singing doing a small bit of singing at the time as well and so I was used to being in front of people maybe they saw that I never really saw it like that yeah when you look back at it it's easy to see it. but at the time you, I'm just enjoying life I was 23 years of age when I started on television for sure and then because your family is huge into music as well. So I'm yeah. shocked you didn't get into that. Yeah, well, my father played music all his life and uh, my brother plays music and I sang a bit, all right, but uh, there was always music at home. But like I was kind of caught between kind of trad music and Guns N' Roses. Like I went to, I went to Slane in 1992 as a, what age was I? 16, I was probably 15 at the time. I was two. <laughs> well, now I feel really old. <laughs> so yeah, so like, so I like, I, I, I like all that. I, I like kind of, fast pace with a kind of, with a good beat like even going back to the earlier Guns N' Roses stuff like it was pure raw like with all, all the bells and whistles that came in albums after like say Use Your Illusion 1 and 2 like say that Appetite for Destruction album like it was just pure raw yeah. it was pure rock and roll and it was very similar when it came to say trad music when you had Seamus Begley and Steve Cooney playing like <clears throat> it was just pure raw motion and it was just fast it was hard hitting yeah. and that's what I liked okay so when you then when you started you didn't go into the music yeah. you were in TV yeah you weren't doing your dip. Yeah. What was your mom thinking? My mother said, Gee, are you sure about this? And I said, look, I said, I'm just going to give it a go. I can always go back and do the dip some other time. Yeah. And that was it. And really, it, it just it just went on from there where I was where I was working all year round on the weather. And then I was I was on the weather and continuity in TG Carr for 11 years altogether. But like they'd send me off then. I think the first year, I think it was 2002 and 2003. I was doing uh, a summer show called Fail To, which went around to all the festivals. So I was at a different festival every week and the show went out then on a Wednesday. So like that was really good fun. And then there was other things like the Gradham Cole, that'd be the kind of the big trad music awards. I did the first one in 2001. <coughs> and I did all these other shows. Then I did the country music show, Glore Tira, for a good few years. And then in 2006, I did a show for RT called Charity Eurostar. Yeah. It was Eurostar, but for people who were well who were well known. This is the irony. I wasn't well known at the time. <laughs> I was definitely the least well known person in the whole group. Was Catherine Thomas Catherine on that? Catherine was on that year. Okay. John Aldrich, who played for Ireland, was on that year. McLean Burke from Fair City. Uh, Brian Murray and Una Crawford were in Fair City as well. They were on it. Roddy Collins was there. Shane O'Donoghue, who's, who's with uh, CNN now. And um, who else was there? I was there. There was a girl then on Rust from Rust and Rune, Oina from Rust and Rune. Right, okay. And it was it was funny really because I was used to singing kind of trad songs and so on and so forth. Like the first night I went out, I went singing Sweet Child of Mine from Guns N' Roses. Like, yeah, you actually showed me photos of that yeah. a couple of years ago. Yeah. The hair. The hair, yeah, the <laughs> hair. So uh, so that was good fun. So that was 2006. And then after that, things changed because people kind of really knew, they began to know who I was at that stage. And then... The following year, I did the travel series for TG Car. We did yeah. Route 66. We did the Blues Highway. We did kind of those honky tonk heroes, and then we did the uh, Route One, which was down the east coast of America. Oh wow! So they were the kind of they were the big ones. And then at the say the last when we finished the last one of them, I was asked to do the Rose of Tralee, and then a show called The Daily Show came along with RTE. I was asked what I presented with Claire Bourne, so the two was presenting it. So that was 2010, and I left TG Car then. Wow. To pursue that again, it, like it was probably a kind of a, a crazy thing to do in one sense because 2010 the economy was bad, 
uh, we were in a big huge recession and I was leaving a full time job so that's that, that's so, sorry you were leaving I left TG Car that time yeah for for RTE to take up a job that was there for a year oh wow yeah so it was kind of well I won't say it was stupid but it was kind of crazy looking back yeah. Like the ignorance is bliss was totally kind of coming at me there. Didn't realize what because it, it could have not come back the following year. Now we were looking that the, the Daily Show came back the second year, and then that turned into the Today Show that moved to Cork. That we're here twelve years later. So wow. in one sense, I was lucky that it that it worked out the way it did. And what made you go for it then? What gave you I, that like I drive? Don't, I don't know. I, I don't know because I'd always be a person who would be kind of a bit of security was always important to me because. Like I had a mortgage, uh, I, I don't need a mortgage taken out about two or three years at that stage. So there was a good 20, 30 years coming yeah. that had to be paid. We were in the middle of a recession. So I, I suppose somewhere deep down there, maybe I believed in myself that I could do something different. Yeah. I had a lot of the stuff from TG Carrick done <clears throat> at that stage. But it wasn't even that, because I liked doing those shows as well. The Glory Tears, that was just a great show to be involved in. That's still going. Yeah, I know. Uh, which is always good fun. And um, Which I, was the best crack? Uh, the, I suppose the American shows were great. The American, like say, like you're like like one day you're out talking to somebody on the side of the street, and then you're not uh, the second day you're inside in uh, Burt Reynolds' kitchen having tea with him doing an interview. Yeah. So that type of stuff. So the variety of it was great. But what worked well for me was that I was left out during the summer. I was like cattle. I was in the shed for the winter, right? And then I was left out <laughs> into the field for the for the summer. And of course, like any young calf, went for the electric fence straight away when I when I came out of the uh, when I came out of the shed. So that I, I liked that dynamic where I was in for the winter and then say around April May I'd say okay I need to start moving. So then they'd send me out for a, a bit of the summer and holidays. And then I come back in for September. So I, I liked that it. as well. Yeah, that's really yeah. cool. But who I'm dying to know, like who was around you that was telling you like yeah go for it like no. this is. So, like how, so how did you have the confidence to just keep going i don't know it's that the, the, maybe there was a bit of naivety there maybe there was this like i enjoyed what i was doing and I were you suppose, getting a buzz from it i was getting a buzz from it and i was enjoying it and i think that's always a good barometer now okay. that won't work out all the time that's the other side of it like yeah. so sometimes you'd be having a great buzz from something and it just mightn't be working out or it mightn't work out for you but sometimes you just have to go with things in life because if everything's so structured you just keep going around the roundabout all the time. Whereas you need to tend you, you know, you need to back yourself too. Like anyone watching and listening to this now, Sarah, and they might be at this whole crossroads in your life if you want. Will I or won't I? Do you know what? Go for it, like. Because <laughs> like say, I always say like, there are two types of pain in this world, right? I know what you're going to say. What? The pain of regret. No, discipline first. Okay. The pain of discipline and the pain of regret. Okay. They're the two types of, of pain you have. Do you know what I mean? So if you're disciplined enough to stick with what you believe in, Okay. As in to go for something, to go for a goal, to have it. And to have the discipline to not turn around and say, okay, I'm, I'm giving up. But to have the discipline to go, okay, I'm going to go with this and go yeah. for it. Then you can turn around and say, do you know what? I tried it. It didn't work out. Big deal. We're going to try again. You I know? love that yeah. though. But like I said, there's nothing worse than the pain of, of regret where you're going, crap. Has there ever been anything in your career where you were like, I really regret doing that or not doing that? No, I, I, I think I've been lucky enough. Like, but I, I was lucky enough people took a chance to me. You know, that, like say, you could be the most whatever in the world, but unless somebody believes in you, unless you have a small bit of luck, Sarah, no matter what you're doing, you need that in life. Okay. Whether it's an Northern Ireland football final, if you're playing one of them, you could be the best team in the world. But if you don't have a small bit of luck, you mightn't win it. And you, you, have, to, you have to look at it like that. And who, like, who was your first kind of mentor then in this business? I don't know if I, I don't think I had a mentor. Did you, you not? Like there was a lot of freewheeling with it. And do you know, sometimes like the more you tell people, the more you give your power away. What do you mean? Say, for example, say like, I wouldn't tell everybody, I wouldn't tell many people lots of things about how I do things, if you know what I mean. Because, how you do things. Yeah, because you're giving your power away. Like you're like, say, there's a reason why people have me on the afternoon show because I am who I am like. But if I share some of that with lots of other people, sure, they'll be trying, they'll be trying to, steal my position maybe you know yeah but that's really interesting that you're saying yeah. that but i'm like you are who you are yeah. and then they've obviously gotten you yeah for you yeah but you have to believe that too yeah but you but but like say i, I still think by keeping things to yourself like you're keeping part of it's not even the mystique but it's part of your power of who you are like you know because there's the public persona and then who you are as a private person as well like there's like say my my principles and values like i wouldn't share them with everybody because I think they're private, but that's what kind of keeps me grounded and centered, if you like. Yeah, I never, 
would have thought you were a very I know we all all can be very private but I never yeah. would have thought you were a private person or even considered yourself yeah. that would, would you ever would you, would you look at me now and say I'm a person who prays every night no yeah see I do though okay yeah why because well, so people pray for different reasons people pray because they think it'll get them into heaven right and why it, do you, why do you pray be. because it makes me feel good at that moment in time in that moment in time where I say my prayers before I go to sleep. Have you always done that as a child? I've even? always done that since I'd say maybe maybe even since my communion, since I was seven or eight. And I've done it ever since for the last 40 years. And do you play, pray for other people? Yeah, or? 100%. Yeah, I would. And if I was going past a church, I'd light candles for people. Okay. Um, somebody wrote a very nasty letter to me one time. And I, I was in the, in the church the following day and I lit a candle to that person too. That's really good. Cool. I'm I'm actually shocked. I, I genuinely wasn't expecting yeah. you to say that at all. But I've so much respect for you to like doing that. Yeah, and it's it's not for everyone. It's not for everyone. People might say that's a lot of hoo ha, and that's fine. That's their perspective. Do you go to mass? I go. Well, I was at mass Easter Sunday. Um, I hadn't been to mass for a while. I I, I wouldn't be there every Sunday. I <clears> might go a few a uh, few times a year. But I do like going in there. I like going to mass when I'm in there. I enjoy it when I'm in there. I don't believe everything the priest says. Okay. I pick some of it and I take what I like and I, I carry that with me. No more than watching a TV show. You're not gonna you're not gonna take the whole TV show home with you, but you're gonna take pieces of that home with you too, and it's very similar like that. And it's about being here now and about feeling good now. And about we're we're here in this moment in time. We can't change what's happened, we don't know what's gonna to happen tomorrow. But I'm here talking to you now and I came here with the with the idea of I'm gonna have a great fun here and that's where that's what we're having i'm not worrying about what i'm doing in an hour's time i'm not worried about uh did i leave the immersion on in the house i'm here now so here i am do you know what i mean and oh, that's yeah. the way I, that's the way i look at it i really appreciate you saying that and when you're saying that i'm there going i feel like especially within this industry yeah. that that's something that you have to learn so is that something that you've learned I, only recently no I, 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 I don't think you can learn it i think it comes to you more so than you learn it i think if you go out trying to learn that you're thinking about learning it which doesn't have you here in the now whereas if you're just kind of having the chat and where you go like you know no but what i'm saying is about being in the moment yeah. and being present yeah. because especially like with social media and yeah. stuff like that it's really difficult i personally don't find it difficult yeah. i would consciously be present of things i'm doing yeah equally i have my days and my moments where yeah. i'm just like like I'm meeting myself coming back. Yeah. I don't know if you can learn it, but I know, it, I think it, it takes time and I suppose it's more experience than anything else and just being comfortable within yourself. I don't think there's a textbook you can read to say, okay, oh, that's how you do it. Yeah. I think it comes to you naturally, uh, just being in the moment. And I know I'll say people are, will be listening to this and say, oh, look at these two talk about being in the moment and everything. But I think in the world we live in, as you say, with social media and everything, yeah. before we didn't have to do that because there weren't as many distractions. No, we do have to go, hang on a second, stop here. Okay, here we are. There's a bit of that involved. But did you always do that though? No. When, yeah, that's what Be I'm saying. I didn't, I didn't do it because we didn't have to do it. Because the social media wasn't there. We didn't have all these other outside influences kind of pulling at you. Whereas we do in life now. Do you know what I mean? Like, so what would you say is pulling at you now that you're kind of like, okay, I need to just focus and say I'm in the Well, moment. I could be thinking of all the stuff I have to do this evening because I have a list. I'm, I started this list, right? Yeah. Which are great because even last night... Love though, a list. Landed home last night. So on the list was... All the different things to do. But I can go away to sleep then <clears throat> after that because it's all in the list. Yeah, it's out of your head. That's it. It's, it's out of my head. It's on the paper. So back to your question. So if I wasn't in the moment, I'd be thinking, okay, when I go home, driving home here, no, I'll stop on that lawn for a coffee in McDonald's <laughs> and have another hour from there and then I'll sit in and then i Whereas opposed to, that's all done now. I know what's going to happen later. I'm not worried about it. But like I even do things that, say, if, if I do something that's not on the list, right? I'll write it into the list and, so cross, it off and cross it off <laughs> like, yeah, I know, just to make myself feel good about the whole thing, you know? <laughs> That's so, a real yeah, thing though, yeah, like it, it gets like, the yeah. endorphins going of yeah. like feeling like you're actually like after yeah. completing something. Yeah, I like, yeah, that's why it makes me feel good. <laughs> so it's just a bit mad reflecting on yeah. your career so far, how much it has just snowballed yeah. onto the next job and onto yeah. the next job. Like it, there doesn't seem to have been any gap at all. No, there hasn't been so far. I've been, I've been looking like say, even with the Today Show, like, like we're, we've been very, very lucky with that. Like we started that in 2012 and we were doing 80 shows a year and the show was 50 minutes. And now we do 166 shows a year and two and a quarter hours. That's whatever. That's what that's what's in every show. So it's, it's a lot. It's a lot of TV. 
and there are rumours that it might be going all uh, on through the summer next year not this one but the following year so we'll have oh, to see, wow yeah so we'll have to see what uh, what, 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 what will come of those rumours at the moment so uh, but no I've been very very lucky like say to have a show like that and I want to know when you realised that you were actually famous was there a point that you were like... Ah, uh, you know, geez, you can't be going around thinking you're that like... No, you, I know I knew you were going to say that because yeah. you're there going... Jeez. You're in Ireland and what people are saying. But there, went, no, there <laughs> had to have been a time when you were like, if oh, I, Jesus. If I went back to West Kerry now thinking that I was anything more than my mother's son, no, I'm just, I'll tell you what, they, <laughs> they'd bait me out of the place with a three-quarter inch weapon pipe. <laughs> they wouldn't let you in. <laughs> Not at all. Well, the, like I know, I know what you're asking, but yeah. I, 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 I don't, I don't, I don't know. Like it's not something that I that I really think about. And like even my Ogie came home one evening, one evening from school. He said, "Daddy, you're famous." I said, "Well, what does that mean?" He said, "Well, do people know who you are?" I said, "Yeah, people know who I am." But I said, "What's the most important thing?" He said, "That you're my dad." And I said, "Exactly." Oh, that's so nice. That's it. Yeah. That's so lovely. So, but like, 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 even the place where I'd have a few pints and all that, like, I said they don't care whether I'm on TV or fixing them. It doesn't matter to them at all. Like, but you have people coming up to you. It's always very, very nice people coming up and saying hello. Like, particularly older people in one sense after COVID, because we were the we were, I suppose, one of the only connections people had at the time yeah. because we were on all, all all the time during COVID. Yeah. And after as well, and to see older people, I, I'd always have a few. Probably shouldn't say this now. Go I'd on. always have a few Today Show mugs in the boot of the car. For older people, when I meet them at gas stations and so on and so forth. Okay. Yeah. But you know what I'm going to ask you for now? What? To get out to the boot of the car and get me a Today Show There's mug. There's a Today Show mug there, yes. Is I'll, there? I'll bring one in for you. Okay, well, I'll, I'll get you an unfiltered mug. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have one now, but I definitely want one of those. This episode is brought to you by glassonline.ie. They are an Irish-owned company based in Mullingar, County Westmeath. They supply high quality glass, mirror, polycarbonate plastic sheeting and accessories. They supply made to measure toughened glass suitable for tabletops for both indoor and outdoor furniture. And they supply glass shelving too. They're available for delivery across various parts of Ireland. Visit glassonline.ie for more information. So Di, social media wasn't yeah. there when you started. So do you find it a bit strange now that it's such a thing? Yeah, I, in, in one sense, I'm happy it wasn't there when we started. <laughs> Why? <laughs> when, we, when we were a lot younger. <laughs> so, because uh, there's no evidence around the place. Yeah, exactly. But in one sense, it was easier, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, but then it was harder to promote yourself if you were trying to get noticed and so on and so forth. So there's that side of it. Where now you can go on social media and do some crazy things and people know who you are and use that as a base for what you want to go on if you want to but i always found that the the i think the longer it takes to get towards the top in your career on tv or radio the longer you will stay up there as opposed to somebody who will shoot straight up they're going to come straight down in a short period of time like to be fair i was on tv i'd say i'd say seven years right on TV, seven years before people really began to notice who I was. Like, I don't think you can go into it saying, okay, seven years time now, people are going to know who I am. I'm going to make a big <laughs> impact. I think just by being yourself will carry you there and take the time part out of it. Enjoy what you're doing. That's what I'd say to people. And once you're enjoying what you're doing, like I said, the whole famous thing is, 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 is like, it's, it's bizarre because everybody wants to be famous. Now they do. In one do. sense, yeah. It's like, particularly teenagers, you're going, okay, you want to be famous. Yeah. But what for? Oh, I just want to be famous. No, you have to be famous for something. Like. Yeah. Or you have to be... T- take, take away the word famous, but in known. What are you known for? Like, you know? Yeah. And say if you're way. known for something. Like, the famous is a kind of just a fancy word for being known. Yeah, yeah. I know what you're saying. And like a popularity thing. Yeah, th- there's a thing. And like, say, I, I think that feeds people's ego. And then you get to a stage where your ego is kind of, eh, you don't care about the ego anymore. Like, you know? Yeah. And th- that's a good place to be. But it Ooh. takes a long time to get there, I think. What, to get rid of the big ego? Uh, like, I, I think everyone has an ego. Yeah, of course. Like say, but I think your ego goes away as you as you continue when you don't really care what people say about you. And um, like an ego is a good thing f- because it keeps you grounded and it keeps you from resting on your laurels that you want to keep going. Like, yeah. So an ego can be used like that because I think people think of the word ego now as having a big head, you're yeah. full of crap, like, you know. But there's more to an ego than that, like, because everyone has a bit of an ego in some way, like, and an ego and all, well, all, an ego kind of can feed into your principles as well and your values, like, you know, say, 
if my values were pushed now that would be my ego kind of being hurt more than my big head me, okay. be, me having a big head if you know what I mean like yeah the ego is such a an interesting it is like yeah but it's it's kind of seen as a negative thing for lots of people but that there's a positive there as well because it keeps you going as well and it keeps you grounded and it keeps you to your beliefs I think okay now the problem with having a big ego is that you believe you're better than you are so <laughs> <laughs> we don't need that no certainly don't need that like yeah do you know what I always find with you die is no matter I don't know like when you walk into a room mm. People just naturally gravitate towards you. Like whether it's man, woman or child. Yeah. Like I've literally been around you with my granny, my parents, my yeah. brother, my nephew. And they all just love you. Ah, well, that's, that's very kind. Yeah, no, but like genuinely, like when, I, like when I've worked with you in the past, mm. I've seen you in action with people and people just, I don't know, they just gravitate towards you. Well, Why do you think that is? I, I, think, I, I think I'm in people's sitting rooms five evenings a week for two and a quarter hours for the last 12 years. <laughs> For uh, the majority of the year, I think there's part of that. Also, like I, I, I enjoy people. I like talking to people. I like having the crack with people. Um, I, I am try. I'm myself on TV, I suppose. And I don't. I, you might be able to answer this. I don't think there's much of a difference between me on TV and me out having a pint in the pub. No, there's definitely not. And I think people kind of like that. I think there's definitely the the the, the Kerry thing kind of stands to us as well I think a lot what do you mean the Kerry thing? people like what Kerry do people mean? do you know what I mean right okay ah, but like, so there, there's the whole cute whoreism Kerry lad person thing that I think people like as well I think that I think it's people like it all around the country because we are who we are as well like there's a bit of that in it yeah and people like going to Kerry and they associate going to Kerry with Kerry people I so, know what you mean so I think may, maybe some of that but um you have this like soundness about you. ah yeah 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 so, Tyg Fleming then. And, Tyg and Fleming is a gas man as well. He was on with us during the week and yeah. said his dad, Derry, like, and sure. Like, you'd hang out with those two lads all day long because, you know, they're full of crack, they're full of blagarding. There's, there's, everybody's in good form. Like, the two lads, when they walk into the room, you start smiling automatically. Okay. And uh, I like those people because there's just a happy disposition uh, from them. So, they were on the Today Show yeah. this week. So, tell me, like, that show was going a very long time, Jahi, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is, yeah. So, as I said, we, we started with 80 shows a year at, at 50 minutes, and now it's 166 every year. So, yeah, we, in the beginning, I suppose, the show was um, a bit more serious than what it was now. And we decided to change because you have an hour of news on after us, more than an hour. You yeah. have the North and then you have the 6 1. And they do what they do, and they do what they do very well. So I was making the point, I said, why do we have to be so serious? Like, we don't have to be. Yeah. And then COVID came along, and we saw ourselves as this warm blanket that you put around, a comfort blanket. So we were staying away from all kinds of serious news stories. and Yeah, you kind of have to, and we have the balance. And so on and so forth. Yeah, so we, we, we injected a load of fun and positivity into the show, and that turned the show around. Wow. It, like I say, people kind of come in just for a bit of fun, a bit of a laugh. You don't know what's going to happen. And that's part of the secret, Sarah. And um, that's why I think the show has done so well. Like, I think there was a show on years ago, even before my time in prehistoric years, <laughs> called Live at Three. And I think that was there around 10 years. And we were right. about 12 going into 13. So we'll be the longest running afternoon show on RTE. I think we are actually at the moment. Yeah, I really like this show, yeah. I have to say. I think at this point, it's worth saying... You basically do like five late late shows a week then. Yeah, five late late shows a week. That's what That's we do. It's full like. on. It's full on. But it's easy. Again, like we sit in and away we go. And there are days you're going, you're looking, are we rehearsing this or is this live? And then you look at the clock, oh, geez, this is live. And you go, <laughs> I love this stuff. Because like we do it, ev we do it every day. This okay. is the thing. Like, so it's like a teacher going in in front of a class. It's like, yeah. It's like sitting in driving the car, all of a sudden you're going, Jesus, a clutch here. And, yeah. and then three months later, you're driving without even. Th that's what it's like driving a car. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, and then certain different people get into the car and get out of the car. <laughs> then they say, What are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> so, what about any pre show rituals then? No, I, I have a few pre show rituals for the Rose of Tralee, all right. Oh, do you? It's how I get dressed, yeah. It's, oh, it's go weird. On. Go on. So. It starts with, um, I don't take a shower the, uh, that evening. I take a shower in the morning because I found one year where I took a shower. We're on the show at eight o'clock and I took the shower at half six and my body got, I got really warm oh. because of the hot water, obviously. And then my body stayed warm. So I was roasting for the first half of the show. <laughs> so I said, there you have it. Uh, lesson learned. Don't ever do that again. But um, I always go to sleep before the Rose of Tralee between six and seven. So I wake up at seven and then we're on at eight o'clock. 
I'll always go to sleep for 40 minutes or an hour. Sorry, you to be asleep before yeah. you go on air? Yeah. Well, well I, I wake up at 7, so I have a full hour to get ready. Like, I don't know why I'm so yeah. shocked with that. Oh, it's great. It's brilliant. A lovely power nap. And then, so I'll get dressed, okay? Boxer shorts, short dicky bow, socks, pants, jacket. Oh, my good God. Yeah. Do you not be paranoid, though, that you'll sleep in it? Like, oh, no, sure, you'll have somebody there oh, knocking no, at your door. The, sure, the show can't go on without you. Well, there you have it. Like, yeah, so... <laughs> But yeah, that, that's one of the rituals I have, like, yeah. Oh, I love that you do yeah. that. And um, But is it... it but see, I mean, if, it, uh, the first time I hosted the Rose of Three, that's the way I got dressed. And I thought it worked well the first time, so I said I'd keep it going. All right, like you So anything like that, any kind of look thing that, that I think might bring me luck, I'll, I'll chance it, like, you know. So you'll just keep doing it. So what if you didn't do it that way? I, I don't know. I haven't done it that, uh, any other way. And how long are you doing the Rose of Three then? 14 years. 14 yeah. years. Like, you are Mr. Rose of Tralee. Well, kind of. Uh, only for, well, see, the thing about it, like, say, I'm only the host, of course, I've Catherine with me now since last year. Yeah. But it's not about the host, it's not. It's about the roses themselves. So that, yeah. that's what's enjoyable about the Rose of Tralee. That takes pressure off me because it's about them, it's about their families, it's about their communities here in Ireland or their Irish communities in America or England or Australia or whatever. And uh, that's the way I go into it. Like, I'm the least important person there. I know what you're saying and I'm sure if anyone any of the roses watching that will definitely appreciate you saying that yeah. and that you're making it about them yeah but I think when you're presenting it you just know that it's in safe hands and you know the show inside out yeah there's that, certainly like because I can tell you though that this this is how it works Monday night three roses break three roses news okay four roses break four roses break music four roses we'll see you tomorrow night okay <laughs> Tuesday night is three roses break three roses news Four roses break, four roses break, four roses. Um, band, winner, uh, winner of the rose, go around the house, winner of the rose, actually, see you next year. So that's the kind of, that's how it's broken up in my head. Okay. Yeah. And do you find, like, it, is it pretty wild down? I've actually never been, but is it wild down in Trilly? It's, it's wild for everyone, bar me, because I'm trying to mind myself, like, there's parties happening night and day. My focus is on Monday and Tuesday on TV. But believe me, the singer isn't in the second chorus of the Rose of Tralee and I'm gone bolted for the bar. Are you? But I mightn't have drank no for about two months before that. Yeah. Like I always go on this kind of strict kind of get fit. Yeah. Eat properly. Uh, no drinking diet for about two months. So like I'm down there like I'm won't, I'm ready to go. Like. Well you're raring to go. But at, at half eleven on, on Tuesday night I'm raring to go out then after that like so stand back you better be ready like. I can imagine. <laughs> Order them all to the following morning trying to get me <laughs> off the pitch like you know. But like it's only on once it's only on once a year yeah. right. So is that why you have so much love for it? Ah, it is like uh, there's a few it's things like, because, like we grew up in it all along because, like we're about an hour west of Tralee where we are in West Kerry so there was um, we always followed the roads of Tralee uh, we went to Tralee twice a year when we were younger shopping so you got a pair of pants to go and runners to go back to school in September which yeah. was the time of the roads of Tralee so we always went in at the end of August and you got did the same thing at Christmas yeah so they were our big days out when we were growing up okay. so we were always in and around the roads of Tralee even growing up and then like I was I had hosted the Kerry Rose selection over 20 years ago so I was with them for a good while did you? Yeah. so and you were I, very like, heavily involved and before. then I was, I was on the regional judging panel in 2005 and 6 and then I was on the international panel judging panel on 07 wow no, zero eight and then zero nine. Zero eight. Yeah. Do you want to know a fun fact? What? I actually went for the rules of Tralee in zero eight. Did you? Yeah, I didn't get it. Jesus. Dahi, Brendan McCardell, is that his name? Yeah. Who is he? Get on to him, ring him there. I need to have more than him. Yeah, I know. And he was like, I sang um The Rose of Allendale. Oh, the Rose of Allendale. Yeah, exactly. So I sang oh. that and two thousand eight, that's the same year as Rita went for it. No way. Yeah, she was in it two thousand and eight. Yeah. Was she? Yeah. I, oh wow! Yeah, New Jersey Rose. New Jersey Rose, yeah. Oh. So I was on the I was the the chair I was on the judging panel that year. Stop it! Yeah, and then I was on the I was the chairperson of the judging panel. So hold panel on now. Year, yeah. You weren't the presenter. No, not when that. you met Rita. No, I was on the judging panel. Oh. So could you imagine that conversation with her parents when she didn't get it? So what did you say? I think she's a great one. I said I was looking at the bigger picture, like you know. You were like, put her through. <laughs> she is brilliant. <laughs> So Jesus, so yeah, so that was it. So I wasn't, I wasn't hosting that. Year. I didn't take over the hosting until the twenty ten. Oh yeah. wow! Yeah. Sorry, who was the host then before Ray you? Ray Darcy. Ray was there for about five years before me. Yeah. Tuberty was there for about two years before him. Marty Whelan was there for about six years. Wow. 
Derek Davis did it one or two years when Gay Bourne was sick. Yeah. And Gay was there for around 15 or 16 to 17 years or something. So when you were on the panel then, did you ever think she's I'll actually be? No. Oh, no. Again, like... <laughs> Like, You're a really lucky person. Then, I'm not trying to say, say I had no aspiration to, to go f- to do anything, but these jobs just fell into my lap. If you, if you, like say, right. I didn't go after say, okay, I want to be the host of the Rose of Tralee. Okay. It just happened. So you weren't manifesting this? No, no, not at all. But I was having great crack being on the judging panels and everything. Okay. And uh, like say, I was on TG Carr at the time. And as a judge, you're going to be shown on TV if you like. So I saw the benefit in that. Yeah. But I also believed in it as well, like, because it's a big thing for Tralee. It's a big thing for Kerry. It's a big thing for Munster. a big thing for Ireland internationally, like. So I, I, I believed in all that part of it. So then when I became the host in 2010, I, I followed on with that and, and kept going with it because I saw the importance of it, like, you know. Okay, and what would you say then? I feel like sometimes the rules of Tralee is misunderstood yeah. and then it gets a lot of criticism mm-hmm. then. What would you say to people then that do criticise it? Well, see, certain people go to criticise things anyway, so there's no mm. problem. Off you go. I've no, I've no problem. Everybody has their own opinion. I'm not gonna, I'm not trying to uh, persuade anyone to follow the rules of Tralee or anything, but I can tell you what the rules of Tralee means to me. The rules of Tralee means to me it's a celebration of Irishness, but it's also it's, an, it's a celebration of Irish women. So when is a celebration of Irish women out of date? Never. Okay. So that's where I come from. Fair enough. That's yeah. a really good point. Yeah, that's it. That's what I believe in. It's a celebration of Irish women. It has always been a celebration of Irish women. And if, like, say, people say that the Rose of Tralee uh, isn't forward looking, hang on a second. Go back to the 1980s. The majority of the Roses would have been maybe teachers, Gardaí. They were called Ban Gardaí that time. Uh, air hostesses are something that would be seen that time as a female role. No, what have we got? We have doctors, we have occupational therapists, we have engineers, we have, we have everything. Yeah. So it's a pure sign of that the Rose of Tralee has moved forward. Trans but women are allowed in. One hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. You're allowed to have babies. You're allowed to have babies. You're allowed, allowed to, to be, be married. married. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, they, 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 those rules have changed during the years with the times. So it does represent Ireland as it is now. I, I certainly think it does. Anyway, you know, not ever. It's not for everybody. It's, it is for loads of other people. There's a fifty-one percent share of people watching it last last year on the Tuesday night. Yeah. So and and again, if if it's something you're not into, that's no problem at all. I do think anyone that is criticising the rules mm. of Tralee don't fully understand the rules of Tralee. Yeah, there could there, there can be a bit of that. Yeah. And um, and that's fine too. Yeah, it is fine. That's fine too. And yeah. yeah. And the rules of Tralee last year was our very own Rachel Duffy. She was yeah one hundred percent like you like say it was at last you, you had a great year you were the Talton Cup you the flag hole and you'd <laughs> Rachel Duffy. <laughs> we were so yeah, lucky. Yeah, you were pox lucky. We really yeah. were. I have to say, for me, Rachel really got me into the roles of Trilly. Yeah. I just think she's such a fabulous person and yeah. she carried herself so well throughout the entire competition. Yeah, she's, she was absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Like, and again, somebody who genuinely didn't expect to actually be crowned the roles of Trilly that night. Yeah. Like, I remember she was on stage and like she spoke about her mom and she spoke about yeah. her family, the importance of family and just being her. Yeah. And we were talking earlier on about being in the moment and that was definitely one of these times where somebody was on stage and she was just in the moment wow. and she, she i think she felt that you know this is about her family it's about her community here in westmead uh, and it's about people you know who lose people in life and you can move and you can get on with your life you, it doesn't have to stop you in your tracks yeah it doesn't mean that you, that anything has changed that, that okay this has happened but we have the strength inside us to move on and i think that's one of the strong uh, points that rachel had for the whole year yeah, she really did. And are you able to, like, did you know Rachel was going to win? As in, no, like... No, the, the, like, say, for example, I do all the I do all the interviews, and then at the end you go around, I say something about all of them. Okay. And it's at that point when I open up the, the envelope, that's when, I, that's when it is. Yeah. The only thing I'll ask is that the producer gives a name in my ear as well, just to make sure that what he's saying is the same thing that's written in front of me. Yeah, it's matching up. Yeah. But do you I know obviously you don't know because you're not like judging yeah. or you're not the one putting the name on the or in the envelope mm-hmm. but do you know inside though like are you there going oh, yeah she's a no. good chance oh really no not, not like when I was Why? When, when I was a judge you like like say when you're a judge you're not looking for faults in any of them but, but okay. you're looking for the, actually you're actually looking for the opposite you're looking for things that stand out so oh, yeah. that's when you're in the judging role because that's your job like my main job as the host is to make sure that the rose is happy going on stage is happy up there and comes off saying i want to go back up there again once that's achieved that's my main concern but when 
the winner is announced and then the fo- you're looking at it the following day you can say oh i can actually see why this person was picked but at the time you're in a totally different mindset yeah. because you want them to do well like you really want them to, you want you want every one of them to do well and to be in a happy place because like they're like it like it's it's so easy to get criticized for anything you do these days yeah and this is one of the things about the, about the roles of Tralee and every one of those women that go on stage and that people don't speak about like they go up there they put themselves out there like yeah as in there is no hiding place up on that stage and they give it their all like you know and i don't think many people think of the courage it takes to actually do that in yeah. front of two thousand people in the audience and up to seven or eight seven or eight hundred thousand people at home yeah it's a lot and the strength to be able to do that <clears throat> to do it as we spoke about having social media there now as well and yeah. straight away you could be telling a story about losing somebody oh my god i hate her dress I know and that's the comment say. about you going, oh my God, you're not even listening to this person, like you know. Yeah. But um, and they're strong enough to know that that's could be coming their way, and they still go and do it, and they show a tremendous amount of strength that I don't think we talk about enough, really. It's a like say we all get judged uh, in different ways now, but to actually put yourself forward into something that you are being judged. Yeah. I think it takes a lot of character to do that as well. Particularly these days, I think it's really, it's, it's a tough thing to do. And they do it, but they don't think like that. They go there to, to I suppose, celebrate their life yeah. and what they've achieved up until then. Like, I, like I'd like i be up on stage going, jeez, I've actually nothing achieved. <laughs> like, I, was, I remember being on stage when I had one or two rows going, holy shit, I've nothing achieved in my life at all. <laughs> as this as this 23-year-old rattled off all the things that she'd done. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm only a TV presenter. <laughs> so yeah so that's the way i look at it as well like so. yeah for sure but we're here we're both up there we're both enjoying it that's the main thing yeah exactly yeah. but image is such a, a thing these days mm. regarding with social media yeah. people always comment on how you look it's yeah. one of the first things how important is image to you well i suppose when you work on tv that's the first thing they see yeah and it's part of who you i suppose who you are and who you become um, I was never really too bothered about what people said about me, my appearance or anything. But one thing that I wanted to do, and I, I, I sorted out last year, was I got a, I got a hair restoration yeah. in the front. It looks great. Yeah, it looks fantastic. It looks and it's something, it's something that I'd been thinking about for a while. Uh, but I never thought of not doing it because people might think it's strange or, or oh, what's your man doing kind of thing. I, this is something that I wanted to do, and I said, I'm just going to do it. Yeah. So I went down to the CHRC in the Bonds and Tralee, uh, and I had a consultation down there. I heard about this new machine they had. It's an AI machine that actually takes the hair. It's a robot that takes the hair from the back of your head. No, you don't feel anything. Right. And uh, they, they numb the head and the back when they're taken out. And you're just there. It's like something tapping the back of your head. And they're actually taken out. So all there's the no pain. Can't fe- didn't feel a thing. Yeah. Wow. So then that's the first part of the day. Then they flip you around. And then uh, they, they, they put all the hairs into the front of your head. Like, yeah, because like I was really... There was this, this. There was nothing there. Okay. And there was it was very, very thin on top. Yeah. So then, um, a year last Christmas, I decided to to, to go and do it. I uh, teamed up with the gang down there. There's a doctor Mohammed down there. He's like he's a he's a he's a, a hair uh, restoration specialist, but he's also a magician. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so so I went for it. It was one of the best things I've ever done in my life. It looks really yeah. good, but yeah. it's really discreet. Like I probably wouldn't have known yeah. you got it done only that you actually said it, yeah. that you got it done. Yeah, and that's and, and that's the the process I have there as well. Like like say when I show people some of the things. They say, "Oh, did it hurt?" Not a, not one bit. Okay. It's like you it's like you get just get a little pick to uh, numb your head, and that's it. You don't feel anything else. So like I was back and I was back uh, at work two and a half weeks after having it done. People said, "Geez, you have a very short haircut." Oh right, okay. So you came back on TV. So you, yeah. So how so long was that period? Two and a half then? weeks with the, during the Christmas break, about two year a uh, year last Christmas, and then it, was, it, it grew. And then you really notice the difference, I suppose, be around eight months later, eight or nine months later, like, and it just gets better from there on as well, like. So wait, now the hair actually grows as normal. You put the hair in, okay? Right. So the hair itself falls out. The ones that I put in, the hair falls out, but the follicle stays in. So they take the hair and the follicle out of the back okay. and they put it in the front. So right. the follicle then is embedded. So for the first couple of, for the first day, for the first two or three days, you have to spray it every half an hour, an hour, just to make sure it's nice and wet. Now you can't wash your hair or anything. Well, you just spray it with water. Days. Spray it with water, yeah, just to make sure. I suppose if you're, if you're, if you're putting plants into the garden, you'd have to put water on it. <laughs> so then uh, after a few weeks, then the hair is actually fall off, right? But the follicle is still inside. Oh. It's the follicle that grows back out again. 
That's yeah. mad. Yeah, it's brilliant though. Yeah. So and that just keeps. So you can you get your you can get your hair cut. Okay, one hundred percent. It'll keep growing forever then. That's it. That's mental. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I like say like I I'm, didn't know that. Like I'm forty seven years of age. Like I I know I know lads in their twenties right. who have serious kind of. Um, self-esteem issues yeah because they're losing their hair and they don't want to go out they don't want to meet people yeah and there's an embarrassment about it and like say i'm always like the amount of people that get on to me when when, when the story got out that i got my hair uh, restored the hair restoration done they were saying oh my god like i can't believe it. it's great to have somebody talking about it to have a man talking about it and i never kind of looked at it like that thinking okay maybe this is bigger than what I re- yeah. thought it was like I said look women get stuff done to their hair all the time no one takes any notice of, of it at all yeah I know some women who have who have had the hair restoration there's also a thing called the PRP where they take some of, some of your blood out they spin the blood around and there's plasmas there as well and they put that into your head as well to make it to make it grow oh, even yeah. more to something so the vampire facial the vampire facial on okay. the head like yeah if it's good enough for Kim Kardashian it's, it's good, good enough for Dottie yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it so um but yeah the amount of the amount of younger people who were really, really bothered about it. Yeah. Surprised me. I never, I never, I didn't realise that people suffered so much about it. I have to say, when I seen you putting this yeah. up on your Instagram, I was like, first of all, I didn't, I wouldn't have noticed that you got it done, yeah. which I think is a really good thing yeah. because some, you can see, like, there's horrendous jobs out yeah. there. That, but yours was really discreet. Yeah. And done really, really well. Yeah. But I also thought as well, when you did put it up on your Instagram, that I, I knew straight away that younger men would be delighted that you did yeah. to normalize it. Yeah, we have to normalize these things. Yeah. Like, yeah. There's no point of suffering in silence when you can do something about it. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact then as well that say I, I was going down home to Tralee as well to have it done down there was great as well. Like, you know, but yeah. like I, I landed down to the CHRC in the Bonds and Tralee at half eight on a Friday morning and I was back in Galway for I'd say quarter to six that evening. Ah, so, so you're literally in and out in one day. In and out in one day, like, yeah. That's yeah. brilliant. Yeah, and then, and then back to work two weeks later. Two and a half weeks later, yeah. And then, like I said, they call you every day just to make sure everything's okay. And you're, it's so easy to do it now. Say you just take a load of pictures and WhatsApp the pictures to them. Okay. Yeah. So uh, do you have to shave your hair first before you go down? Yeah, you can sh- shave okay. the hair. And that, that, was a, that was an interest. I never had my hair shaved before. Like, <laughs> you, know, yeah. you always had really long hair. Yeah, I had long hair when I was younger, Sarah. When I was a lot younger. <laughs> when I thought I was a member of Guns N' Roses. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I, I know you showed me all the yeah. photos of that hair and I loved it but I have to say I really genuinely believe that younger men are definitely yeah. going to really appreciate you speaking out about it yeah um you're so confident in yourself so I think it definitely well, <laughs> no you so definitely sometimes. are but it definitely takes somebody like you yeah. in the public eye I think yeah to just make it acceptable for other people that it's just like yeah I'm getting my hair done same yeah. way as women yeah I'm just getting my hair done yeah it's not I, a big deal. I, I don't think I'd, I'd even one negative comment about it okay and what I had was lots of people saying fair play to, for talking about it. Um, this really gets me down. And also sisters and moms getting in contact with me talking about their brothers and sons. Okay, getting that, them vouchers. That they had, that they had noticed that this oh. was bothering them. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. As in talk about it. That, that's, that's what the whole thing is about. You're normalizing something that if there's something there, if there's something you can do to make yourself feel better, do it. Like. Oh, no, I'm all yeah, for that. Yeah, Genuinely, yeah. I am. Yeah. Why would you care yeah. about what other people are thinking? Oh, believe me, what other people say, think about me is none of my business. Okay. Have you always embodied that attitude then? Uh, well, I suppose when you start on TV in the beginning, it's kind of, it's, you're a bit interested in why are other people interested in me, but that's part of it. And then you get to a stage where I bet everything said about me all this day. So. <laughs> That's just how you take it on board. You're just very oh, blasé about can, it. But I suppose there are other people. I said there are. Say if you're having a bad day, then as well, you, it, it can kind of be a burden on you. Not, not just just a bit of a weight on your shoulders. Yeah. But you get out of it then as well. Like you have to, reality is a great thing. Like yeah. Reality and what's in your head are two different things a lot of the time. Like you know. No, I totally agree. Yeah, and you you just have to realize. Hang on a second here. This is the reality of it. Like, it's, I think people can think they can say anything about anyone now because. Yeah. They wouldn't say it to your face or anything. And there yeah. are lots of people who have been heard all their lives and all of a sudden they're being heard. And that's one of the reasons why they say things. Yeah. And But it, th- th- there are two sides of it. Like there's how, there's what they say is one thing. It might be wrong. Yeah. But there's also how you take it and how you take it on board. Like you can kind of go up and walk away from it. But don't do that if it bothers you. If it bothers you, kind of say, okay, why is this bothering me? Yeah. But like I, you do get to a stage where you pff, that's most of my reaction to lots of the stuff there now, like, you know. Yeah. And it, it just doesn't bother me at all. But you were chatting, we were chatting earlier on there about social media not being there when I started. Like, I don't know how I would have been that time. 
Okay. Say if, if there was stuff there. Yeah, you don't know I, how you would have I reacted. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I genuinely don't know how I'd feel. Like, if, if it's me now, I'd say, away you go. But I'm not the same person I was 25 years ago. Yeah. So you do have to feel for people who are starting out now. But you have to, the re- reality is is, the, is where it is for me. Like, as in, this person thinks you're a gobshite or whatever. Like, you know, are you really a gobshite? Do you know what? I'm not. I'm actually kind of an, I'm actually a decent enough person. Like, yeah. Or I'm certain, do you know what I mean? Hang on a second, you know, I'm actually a good person. Like, so this person is wrong. And then I think once you kind of, once you trash it out in your own head going, actually, no, they're wrong, you can move on then as well. Like, But if it does bother you, think about it and think of the reality and then move on from it. Don't just leave it hanging back there because it'll come back to get you. I, when I was setting up this podcast, I was like, I really wanted it a place where people could come on and tell their own story yeah. in their own words. You know, you're not reading headlines. You're not reading it off social media yeah. and just a safe place for people to just tell their own story. Yeah. So do you mind if we talk about your cancer diagnosis? No bother, yeah. Tell us, how did this even come about? It's, it, it, it's, it's strange, right? Because there was a little, uh, a little, I suppose, what I thought was a pimple. Even right. I thought it was an ingrown hair. Yeah. You know, when you say cancer diagnosis, like I was very, like I didn't, I wasn't going to talk about this in the beginning, but say maybe around six or seven months ago, I got a call from a journalist to say, I heard you had a cancer diagnosis and, and would you talk about it? I said, look, I want to make things very, very clear. This yeah. wasn't any life threatening uh, cancer yeah. diagnosis or anything. It was a uh, sun damage, a small bit of skin cancer. And I said, I'll speak about it on the basis that, look, the message is factor 50 all day long, whether it's a sunny day, a cloudy day or anything. But I, I didn't want to sensationalize it, but I didn't also want to throw it away because I know skin cancer can be very, very serious and in an extreme case can be fatal as well. Which So I was kind of very, very conscious of how I wanted to speak about it. But it was, I thought it was a, I thought it was a, an ingrown hair right there in my, in my eyebrow. And so I was going to the doctor and the doctor said, look, um, just get that checked because it wasn't going away. And see, because I put makeup on every day and work, I was taking the makeup off and I thought I was just agitating it. So oh. that's why it wasn't clearing up. So this was going on for a, a month or two, a few months, actually. So the doctor said, look, just get it checked. So I think the doctor kind of knew what it was, really. So And she said straight away, she said, I can tell you that's a bit of skin cancer. So I said, I was kind of like, what? I didn't expect. I thought, no, she was going to freeze it. Like yeah. you can freeze this thing. I thought she was going to do it all in the one day. Like, yeah. I thought I was going to walk out of her office with just a bit of a cold thing there and a bit of a bandage. And she said, no, we'll have to take that out. So I said, well, is it serious? Well, she said, every cancer is serious. I said, well, that's fair enough. So um, that was probably March, maybe. And then... Got of this year or last year? Last year. year and okay. then um, we came off the air uh, probably the end of May on the Thursday. And I got a take cut out then on Friday. So basically it had gone into the muscle up here. So she had to cut in deeper in there. So there was... Uh, three inside stitches and six on the outside so there's a scar there so she did a very good job in hiding it yeah so Thanks. yeah and she said uh look the damage is done now so you need to you need to mind yourself like so every day no factor 50 in my face my neck and it and on the back of your hands don't okay. forget the back of your hands as well because even when you're driving you need to be covered like you need to be protected so and even if it's a cloudy day, people think it's just because it's cloudy. There's no sun there. No, these rays get in there. So I'd yeah. be advising people just factor fifty all the way. Because you'd be out for a walk, like you'd be out for a walk. Out all the time. I, I, somebody was out all the time, like no. And you said, never would have worn factor fifty or. Never wore factor fifty, but I was always going to put on say factor fifteen and twenty oh, and so okay. on. And but yeah, um, that it kind of frightened me. Really, it's kind of one of those things where there's some, somebody sitting across from you, they're, they're talking, you're going, "Geez, what's this now?" You know, didn't yeah. expect this. Really didn't expect this. Uh, but so then she she was a really really lovely doctor yeah. and she said she said are you worried I said well you're after saying cancer like so of course I'm worried she said don't you worry she said leave me do the worrying so I was like so there's one of us worrying here <laughs> <laughs> so I said look what's the story she said look we'll cut it out and that's it okay so then I, I turned up for the for the it was supposed to be a biopsy and I was there saying look I'm kind of have to be on TV again in two weeks time. <laughs> So can because if I was if she was going to take a biopsy, send the biopsy to get it tested, and if it was cancerous, they'd have, we'd have to come back and take it out. So as she was going to cut, um, uh, I said, "Look, what do you think it is?" She said, "Well, I'm pretty sure it's this." So will I be coming back in two weeks' time to cut it out? Um, yeah, can we cut it all out now? She said, "Do you want to do that? Please do." So she took it all out, and then she called me back six weeks later and said, "Yeah, it was cancerous." 
Okay, so she cut it out, all of it out, and then they done yeah. like a test yeah. on it. Then so I said, look, it's, she's, it, it's got to be coming out. And I said, I cut it all out. I said, okay. So she cut it all out, and that was it. So it's weird. It's, it's strange, like, and you kind of gone. But anyway, listen. Yeah. You you if if you see anything, go to the doctor, get it checked, and get it done, and that's it. You move on then. She called me after that. Look, it was what it was. I got the whole thing. That she cut a millimeter all around to make sure that she got everything. Go on with your life. She said, that's it. Wow. cancer free up you go but like again I, I try not to sensationalize it because other people with, with cancer and we all know there's hardly a house yeah. in Ireland that has a knocked on the door so this was the, the the very very mild form but even that get it checked that's what I'd say and factor 50 factor 50 yeah. for sure I, I was just going to leave it as in get it done because no one noticed anything because I no. was off the air and the, the surgeon did a fantastic job. Yeah. Uh, you'd have to come up really close to kind of even notice it. So, and then I don't know how this journalist in one of the Sunday papers heard it. I was really sad though when I read that, if I'm being yeah. honest, as in when I read the fact that uh, you weren't actually going to talk about this but then somebody like invades your privacy and is like, yeah, that's can you just, talk about that's it? That's just part of it but you have to turn it into something good then and that something good is to get the message out to our factor 50. Okay. And that's, that's I, I did, I, I spoke about on the basis that the person wouldn't sensationalise it that I wasn't on death's door or anything like that. Yeah, exactly. And I wanted to be very, very straight about that and very, very, as in this this wasn't life-threatening at all yeah. but this happens and there are skin cancers that can, uh, yeah. can uh, take people's lives if, you know, if they don't mind themselves. So yeah, this is very, very mild but so I decided to do that interview on the basis of the message was get factor 50 on folks. I have to say, throughout this entire interview with you, I'm learning so much from you <laughs> in the sense of like, I feel like you really just meet things like head on. Yeah. You deal with things as they are. I feel like there's no dilly dallying with you. Like you're like, this is exactly what it is. This is what I'm dealing with. Yeah. You don't really like glamorize too much of your life. Yeah. And equally you talk about the things that we should be talking about yeah well you know, life's for living too like yeah. i think you can get a lot of time glamorizing things and like so even with social media you see lots of pictures of people and it's all this perfect thing and it's pure bull like you know? yeah like um i just want to be happy in life and get on with life i don't want to, there's no need to be telling everybody about it people get certain things from that it just doesn't do it for me i want to like say for example i was having dinner with friends when i oh you got to take a picture i said no i'm going to eat it <laughs> I'm actually going to eat the flipping thing, like, you know. So uh, other people get enjoyment of putting up stuff. I want to eat the steak that I've been waiting for. I don't want to be taking pictures. No, picture I don't want to be taking it. picture. And then, But I do then sometimes, because sometimes I feel like I have to, and then I say, I'll fake this. Yeah, no, it's fair yeah. enough. Yeah. Um, can we go back to your yeah. beautiful wife? Yes. So you met her at the Rosa Trilly, yes. but you were not the presenter at no. the time. Okay, so I want to know. Now, be real with me okay, now. You've I'll been be real you. so yeah, far, yeah. so let's keep going okay. with that. Were you looking at her going, I'm going to put her through now because she's fabulous? No, no. Die. No, no, no. Because this, Mom. She was at a stage where, like, say, it was, so it was going to be a winner. There's going to be one winner and there's going to be 31 who didn't. Okay. So, so where was it? This was at the International Road. So this is, this is uh, down in Tralee. In Tralee. On for, she was on TV and everything with Ray and everything. Okay. So I was the judging panel and... Um, the the Aoife Kelly won the road three that year, but I did say that this is that she was a cracker. Okay, what attracted you to her first? Like, what was it? Well, the first thing was because she was good looking, like yeah, of course. Because it's, yeah, the, of it's course. the first thing I saw be even before she opened. I said, "Well, Jesus, this was very good looking." <laughs> so she had a red dress on and she was kind of tanned as well. So I remember that. I actually remember her walking into the room. So uh, oh, I right. can still remember that. So there was instant chemistry, would you say? No, oh, no, no, no. See, see, this is the thing. Like, so she was in the Rose of Tralee, and uh, so I'd probably met her once or twice. Obviously, in the kind of interview thing, and then yeah. kind of once or twice, as in, hello, how are you doing? How are you getting on? Are you enjoying everything? So, it was only after that, then about a year after that. Oh. Even more before we became kind of friends. It just we were friends on Facebook, as lots of people are, and you're sending, hello, how are you doing? Messages. You're over poking there. her. It was a long time after before I poked her. <laughs> 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 it was two years after that again before I poked her properly. And uh, so. Uh, we were friends for a long time and then I was doing a show in America in 2010 which is two years after that okay and we were coming through New York so I said look do you want to meet up coincidentally <laughs> well the, the, the route we the were on route. The, the road we were on were, was coming through New York so that was the first time we, we met up okay and then I finished that trip in Miami in down the Keys in Florida and I was supposed to go home and I flew up to New York 
to meet Rita. Yeah, she's in New Jersey, but she's only over the river. So I flew up to New Jersey. Yeah. And I stayed there for about five or six days. And then I went home. And then I came back over. I went back over again around two two weeks later for the weekend. Yeah. I went back over. So that was around May, June. Right. So we were kind of over and back for the summer to each other. And then she moved over in September that year. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, so you were doing long distance for a while then? For a, yeah, for a few months. Yeah, for a few months. And then she moved over and then she'd go back for maybe a month or maybe a few weeks at a time, then working with her parents again and then back over again. But yeah, so she moved over in September that year, in 2010. So how come she came to you and you didn't go over to her? Because like you have a, an American passport. I do, yeah. But um, that, that was the same time as I left TG Cahar as well, that I went to RT. So I'd moved to Dublin as well. Okay. So a lot of things happened that around that in those few months. So there was a lot of change then for you A lot of change, yeah. That like, say, for example, if... If you go back to even the April of 2010, mm. I was a full-time staff in TG Car and I wasn't going out with anyone. And then, say, that September, I'd left a full-time job, moved to RTE, and started going out with somebody who I started living with in September. You started living with her straight away? Yeah, when she away. moved over here, yeah. So wow. lots, lots actually, it's actually funny when you say it like that, because I never, I never even thought about it like that. So lots actually changed in those few months. Fast so mover. That, and, oh, well, no, but, but see, we really had been friends oh, for, yeah. for a long time before that. Like, we'd been, like, say, even for the year before that, we were, it, we went from messaging each other once a day, or say, once a month, right? That went to once a week, <laughs> and then that went to once a day. Now, this is over a space of eight or nine months. Yes. And then it went to messaging each other 20 times a day. And oh. then we met each other once or twice and then I suppose it's when we would do that trip in America that that's when we that we decided to okay and did you know I know this is such a like a yeah like an like oh, a, I think I think we knew I, I knew from, yeah from that from then, then on I think we knew I you think, knew that you wanted to be with her oh, I think it. so yeah 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 that was it because we again like I say we were friends we were really good friends I think before anything happened and I think that yeah. was a really really good basis for the relationship which that never probably happened to me before. Okay. Where you started going out with somebody and then you get to know somebody. Do you know what I mean? As opposed to knowing somebody really well and going out with them. Yeah. So I think that's probably the first time maybe that that had happened. Okay. Probably. So maybe that's maybe that was one of the big differences. So a year after, we were going out for a full year, really living here. So then we got engaged. Yeah. So Kelly, How did you propose? Oh, well, we went to a place called Weehawken, which is in New Jersey, which looks across at the... New York skyline. Oh, fab. So it was the first place I told her I loved her. So I brought her back there and went down on one knee. Oh, that's so lovely. Know, yeah, romance. There you have it. That is so yeah. lovely. Yeah, I picked the ring myself. Did she? Yeah, no. I a token ring or the actual ring? Excuse you, don't do tokens. Excuse me. <laughs> the real deal. Really? No, I had an idea what she liked, all right, yeah. Oh, like, had you discussed it or what? Uh, we were talking about, uh, yeah, kind of in a very kind of... Ah, yeah, like yeah, that way. Like, I kind of knew what you wanted, all right. Oh, my yeah. God. That's yeah. so nice that so you did got, that. Yeah, got, got engaged a year. After going out for a year, then we got engaged. And the following year, then the following summer, we got married. Uh, where did where, you get married? Married then? down in Dingle and then into Tralee then for the... Of um, course. It, back into Tralee, for, back to the scene of the crime. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. So, yeah, so that's it. Then. And then... Um, it was 2012 two years later then ogie lands so okay. he's 10 now this year so wow. like he's just a love of my life that guy he's just unbelievable like yeah so how has like being a father then changed your... uh, it, it changes you in a good in a, in, a, in a great way because it, it back to as we were chatting about that just living in the moment so sometimes you can go to work and you can take things home with you and you can have all this stuff rattling around your head but when i found when i got home to him that i'd lie next to him in the bed and it was just the two of us like yeah you know He'd, I'd be going in just say good night, so you wouldn't care about anything else in the world. No, and that's great. It's just a great place to be, you know. Yeah, he's so lo he's yeah. so cute. Uh, isn't he? Listen, he's 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 a happy go lucky young fella, and that's all you want. And he, when you see him with his buddies there having the crack and reacting, so that's all you want. I want. I don't really do a whole lot of work at the weekends anymore because I want to be at home, uh, and I want to dot around the place too. Yeah, you're just at a different stage in your life. Just at you a different with. stage where, Fair you, where you just kind of like, um, I try to go for a few points with the friends when I can. I've been out for a few weeks. Like maybe the week after the next, I might go out. Yeah. And um, just to try to get that balance, right? You won't always get the balance because you have other people, you have other friends in who'll call you to come on their pod podcast, right? 
and then you'd have to kind of care about a, a morning of your time off to come to to do a podcast with a friend of yours Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. even though you might have a great plan sometimes the plan sometimes you have to put your plans aside yeah you know. for for uh, your best pals yeah <laughs> <laughs> So then, Di, what is um, a highlight of your career? I know you probably have many, but yeah, there, a I couple of them. There are loads, like, I suppose, the, the, lots of the roads of Tralees were always good fun, like. Like, when things go wrong was always a good fun for me, like. <laughs> like, in the beginning, like, if something goes wrong, you're, fu- you're, you're going, Jesus. But when something goes wrong no, like, you're just ha- laughing, like, because I remember when I, I was in the stage of one of the roses and this, I was chatting away to her next second. I said, why is there a birthday cake coming out on stage? with 20 something candles on it you know so uh, happy birthday <laughs> the whole place thinking it anyway so to make a long story short it wasn't even her birthday but she went with it i said happy birthday oh thanks very much i'll be a cake here for you we all sang happy birthday <laughs> so i said and after i said i didn't know it was your birthday she said it wasn't i said where did the cake come out of somebody got it wrong he said lovely yeah 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 so but some things like that like there's other few weird things like i was asked to be in a movie then uh, with uh, Snoop Dogg oh, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and Keanu Reeves. Stop. What do you mean you were asked to be in a movie with So him? I was in a movie with, with Snoop Madra. Yeah, Snoop Dogg and um, Keanu Reeves. What? Yeah. When was this? Is this it, like an unfiltered uh, no, exclusive? This, well, I know people have seen yes. the movie. Like, Say yes. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It's the first time I've spoken about it on a podcast. Uh, called, right, okay. called Unfiltered. And uh, yeah, no, I was, on a, I was in the SpongeBob SquarePants movie. I knew that. Yeah. Okay. With Snoop Dogg was in it as well. No. Yeah. Wait, so did you get to meet him? No, I was the Irish language. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was uh, King Poseidon in the SpongeBob SquarePants <laughs> movie that I recorded in my own home. Oh, I actually remember you telling me yeah. about this. This was during lockdown, this right? This was during lockdown, yeah. So the produ- well, there was a producer in London. There was another somebody else in, in uh, County Down. There was somebody else in Hollywood. And I was in Galway <laughs> doing uh, King Poseidon, who was kind of uh, a very camp, flamboyant king. Right. Uh, with a West Kerry accent. <laughs> so that's that, so that so that was very very interesting. So I had Ogie in the room with me when I was doing some of the screens because you could see all the SpongeBob SquarePants things up, right. and, up on the screen as well because I had to, I, I had to hit the marks right with the, for the lip syncing of the cartoon. So yeah, so I was in the movie with Snoop Madra and Keanu Reeves and that SpongeBob SquarePants. That is so funny. Yeah, so it was good crack, like yeah. That is hilarious. So any other like random and fun other, facts? Well, like this? Um, I suppose years ago I used to sing songs, and then uh, a neighbour of mine who passed away, said Seamus Bigley, ca- called me up and he said, "Do you want to sing with the Chieftains?" And I said, "Yeah, we'll sing with the Chieftains." So Seamus, myself, and a man called Lawrence Courtney, uh, the Chieftains were recording an album called "Water from the Well." And they were going around to different parts of Ireland singing with different people. So they came as far as Dingle. So they sang with Seamus Lawrence and myself on Pucker Bulla. And that, they recorded it as well for, for TV. So for years, I had friends of mine in America, Canada, Finland, Japan on St. Patrick's Day sending me messages. I'm watching you here on TV in Japan. Because they sent that <laughs> everywhere. And that album then went on to be nominated for a Grammy. So Dahi O'Shea has been nominated for a Grammy. Well, I sang a few verses of a song on an album that was nominated for a Grammy. Same so, thing. Same thing, yeah. <laughs> so there are kind of some weird facts, of, like some real fun random things that I got to do down through the years as well. Like so. I love that. Yeah, yeah. That's class. And then I, I'm so lucky to have you on this podcast. Like genuinely, I really am. Like people have been watching you for over yeah. 25 years on on their screen, in their living room, feeling like they were your best pal. And I'm lucky enough to call you my pal. Ah, uh, but listen, come here. But I, we know each other for a long time. Yeah. I remember you brought me down during the, the around Mullingar during the fly as well. Yeah. And I thought there were people coming up to see me, but they were coming to see you. <laughs> That was great, crack. Great fun. Like, Will you yeah. stop? I had uh, like we were getting selfies and everything, and I had yeah. like women like elbowing me out of the way to get in to, to oh, get well. a photo with. It was yeah. good. For, it was good fun, and you know, Mullingar was made for the flare. Like it was like there was a great buzz around the place. Right. Okay. But I did. I did land into a few pubs already. I can't remember them. In Mullingar. Yeah. Right. Which were your favourites? Come on now. Is our Canon something? Canton Casey. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one. And there was another few up the street. The as gravel. Well. The gravel. Yeah, I was in the gravel arms. Well, Di, what do you want to be remembered for regarding your career? Oh, regarding my career? Oh, geez, yeah. I don't know. In life, as a good dad. Yeah. That would be... Um, God, I don't know, Sarah. That's a good question. What do I be remembered? What do I... Jeez, I don't know. I, it's, a, it's an interesting one to be remembered for something. I don't know. Just a fellow who was there in the afternoon keeping you company. 
Yeah. Something like that. Like, I'd be happy, like, if people say, oh, my grandmother and mother used to watch that lad. He was a nice old lad, that fella. Whatever happened to him? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you know what, though? I always think people will always remember you for how you made them feel. And I definitely think you made people ah, feel really good throughout your that's career. That's kind. Yeah, for that's sure. Kind. So I'm actually going to take this opportunity then to just, I think to thank you on behalf of everybody in Ireland, really, for just making great TV and, uh-huh. yeah, just making us laugh, probably cry along the way as well, and just been for being an unbelievable presenter. I absolutely idolise you for what you do. Uh-huh. And, yeah, I really Thanks, look Sarah. up to you for everything you do. Yeah, Thanks definitely. very much. You make me emotional now. No, but uh, genuinely, well, thank, you. thank you so much. Well, it's, it's, it's what we do every day. We sit down, we, 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 are, we are in people's sitting rooms uh, for... Um, most of the year for over two hours we keep people company people dip in and dip out of the show people stay for the whole thing some people don't watch it at all and that's fine <laughs> and we're there and we enjoy it we try to bring um, a bit of light heartedness into people's homes uh, when you look what's happening in the world at the moment uh, it can be a very very sad place so we try to create a place where people can come and watch the show and have a bit of fun have a bit of a laugh and uh, most of all stay stay true to who we are as Irish people <laughs>